Thank you so much for joining us online today. We so appreciate you checking out this message. Uh, We hope you enjoy it and are inspired to live more and more like Jesus Christ by His grace. If you would like to support the ministries of Rancho, you can do so at rancho.tv slash giving. Set up a giving profile and a reoccurring gift. We'd sure appreciate that. Enjoy. My name is Steve. Uh, If you've been coming over the last year, you might not know who I am. So I am the lead teaching pastor at uh, Rancho Murrieta. We meet at Mesa High School. We are meeting every week as well at 10 a.m. We're outside and it's been beautiful. So if you're in the Murrieta area, feel free to come on by and join us. We'd love to have you over there as well if you ever want to stop by. Um, It's good to be here as we continue this comeback series. Um, Over the past weeks, we've been considering a lot of setbacks, right? setbacks that maybe you have experienced throughout 2020 and how we might come back from those. We looked at the original fall. We looked at broken families. Last week, Job looking at loss. But when it comes to personally, like my 2020, I would say that probably today is the most personal setback and comeback that I've experienced over the past year. Because I was thinking about this One word kept coming to mind, and it's the word powerless. It's the word powerless. I don't know if any of you have felt powerless. I I looked it up, and it means helpless, useless, defenseless, vulnerable. Have you felt helpless or vulnerable at all over the last year? I have. Maybe you have too. Maybe that does define a lot of your 2020 experience. Maybe not. But most people I talk to, the answer would be yes. And I would say what's interesting for me is that that idea of powerlessness is not something I would define myself by. Uh, If any of you know me, I mean, I don't necessarily feel powerless. I feel like I I have the opportunity to make a difference and and, and in my home and in the community, in my neighborhood. So this wasn't something that I would really define myself by until some of the stuff I experienced last year. Now, some of it might just be a vulnerability to the pandemic. Maybe you felt that, this vulnerability that I'm not in control of this thing moving across the world, right? And is it gonna get us? Is it gonna get into my family? Is it not? I mean, for some people, that vulnerability to the pandemic was great. But for me, a bigger part of me was feeling helpless, was that feeling of helplessness watching others I care through go through things over the last year. And I'm not going to lie, man, it was difficult. I was affected in some pretty big ways personally. And I would say that it wasn't things necessarily coming right to me, but things I was watching. And I was feeling helpless about doing anything about it. Or even worse, that there was times I felt useless. I was trying to help maybe, or maybe I thought maybe I could be there, but it just wasn't, there was nothing I could do. And that feeling of being useless, or maybe I didn't handle it right. Maybe I didn't do all I could do to those that were going through things. There were some pretty devastating moments for me over the last year. Some pretty devastating moments. Moments where I feel like I was failing others. Moments that I felt useless, helpless. Moments I felt powerless to be able to do anything and change anything that was going on in some people and lives that I love. And I learned firsthand that feeling powerless can be debilitating, can't it? Feeling powerless can be debilitating and a setback, a setback from believing that you can make a difference. I said this a lot of times before, but losing the belief that you can make a difference is not a healthy place to get to. Maybe you've experienced that. Maybe it hasn't just been the last year, but the last 10 years, where you just get in your head and you get in your thoughts that I'm not making a difference, that I can't make a difference, and that is not a good place to get to. And over the last year, there's been some couple situations where I deeply felt that. And there's another thing that happens when you feel that way, and maybe you've experienced this as well. All of a sudden, you take everything you've done and just make you think differently about it, right? Maybe I've never helped. Maybe I've never been uh, really powerful in people's lives. Maybe I've been useless in a lot of other things than uh, things I thought I was useful in. You ever gone through that? And so all of a sudden, you're rethinking everything, and then you're just feeling like, well, tomorrow I just have nothing to bring to the table. So today I want us to consider an Old Testament story. 
Today, I wanna consider an Old Testament story, this story where a young woman who felt powerless pushed through that powerlessness and became someone who made an influence and changed the course of the history of her people. We're gonna be talking about Esther and we're gonna be thinking about the setback of powerlessness to a comeback of influence. That's what we're gonna be looking at. Her story is found in the Old Testament and it's a very peculiar story because it's the only story in the Bible that doesn't mention God. God's not mentioned in this book. And Martin Luther actually thought we shouldn't even have it in the Bible because of that, right? So it's a peculiar story. It's a story that takes place about 100 years after the Babylonian exile. And it's in Susa, which was the Persian capital at that time. So that's where the story takes place. And there's four main characters in this story. Okay, there's two Jewish people. One is kind of like this elderly Jewish guy whose name is Mordecai. Esther is his niece. She's the second character. But he more raises her as his own daughter. So he kind of is like a father figure to you. So you have Mordecai and you have Esther. Then you have the king of Persia. Now, the king of Persia is kind of like a drunken pushover in the story. He just gets drinks, parties, and then just gets led astray in a lot of different ways, okay? But his main Persian official is a man named Haman. Haman is the villain of the story. So just as a quick overview of the story, what basically is happening in the story is that Haman, that Persian official, hates Mordecai. And the reason he hates Mordecai is when Haman becomes this official and gets put as the highest official in the land, Mordecai, who is a faithful Jewish man, will not bow down to him. And Haman does not like that. So Haman, during one of the king's drunken kind of parties, convinces the king that the Jewish people don't follow their customs and that they're a problem in this empire and they should all be eliminated. And so he talks the king into making a decree that they're going to, at a certain day, they're going to kill all the Jews. I mean, he just wants to get at Mordecai. But instead of just getting at Mordecai, let's wipe out all the Jews. You see it in Esther chapter 3, verse 13. Dispatches were sent by the couriers to all the king's provinces with an order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and little children, on a single day, and to plunder their goods. So that's what's going on with Haman and the king and this decree to wipe out the Jews from that province and the surrounding ones. Now, in the middle of that is Esther. Esther had just been made the queen of Persia. What an honor. She's the queen of Persia. She must have so much power and so much say-so in what's going on. But before you think that, I need us to stop and recognize something. The queen of Persia was basically the main sex slave of a harem to the king. That's what her role was. She was unable to approach the king unless the king summoned her. And when you read the story in the book of Esther, it had been 30 days since she was summoned to the king's quarters. Now, throughout that 30 days, plenty of other ladies from his harem were summoned. So she sees them come and they come back abused and it's the way it is. So this is a situation that we find ourselves, that Esther finds herself in. She knows that if she approaches the king without being summoned, that there's a very specific law for that. Look at what she says in Esther 4. All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman, even the queen, to, ap uh, to approach the king in the inner court without being summoned by the king that has one law, they get killed. That's a pretty heavy reality. This is the culture that Esther is the queen in. And if that's not problematic enough, there was in Esther chapter one, a previous king, queen that did get summoned to one of the king's parties with all of his buddies to uh, entertain them. 
she was so done with being abused, she refused to come when she was summoned. And she just disappears from the story, never to be seen again. That's just not heard of. And so Esther also knows that story. Not only does she know the law, if you approach the king without being summoned, even as the queen, you'd be killed. But she also knows that the previous queen was tired of the abuse. And so when she didn't come, when she was uh, summoned, she disappeared. So see, Esther's position as queen was a life of powerlessness and exploitation. That's the reality in this book. That's the reality. So when Mordecai finds out that there's a decree made to kill all his people, he goes to her and he says, hey, maybe you should go to the king and see if you can get this slaughtering stopped. In Esther chapter 4, verse 13, he says, you know, do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. They don't understand that the queen is also a Jew. And so once that decree starts going, not only Mordecai, all their family, all their uh, friends, as well as the queen will be destroyed. And then Mordecai makes a statement that's a pretty famous statement coming from this book. Who knows, he says, if perhaps you were made queen for just a time as this. It's a pretty heavy ask from her uncle slash the man who raised her. But she's the only hope in this story. And she chooses and decides to go for it. And remember, that decision to go for it is coming from a scared, dangerous and powerless position that she was in. Look at Esther chapter four, verse 16. She says, go, this is Esther, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. I mean, for three days, don't eat or drink anything day or night and all my maids will fast also. And when this is done, I will go to the king. Now listen to what she says, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. She understands this could be a life-altering decision. She's going to approach the king without being summoned, knowing that it can mean and cost her her life. And guess what? She does it. (laughs) She does it. And in the course of just some amazing events, Haman is exposed to being who he is because, you see, Mordecai actually rescued the king in the past. He was hearing some of his other officials talking that they were going to do kind of a coup against the king and kill him. He warned the king, and the king was able to stop that. They end up removing those officials. That's when Haman becomes the highest official, where then Mordecai doesn't want to bow down to Haman. But at one time, after the decree to kill the Jews was made, the king wakes up one night and says, hey, let's read about some of our history. And goes, oh, my goodness, Mordecai saved my life, and we never celebrated him. So you can imagine when he decides to throw a party for Mordecai. And Haman's all, you're going to be kidding me. So they throw a party for Mordecai. They celebrate Mordecai. They find out the queen is Mordecai's niece. She's a Jew. And Haman's exposed to wanting to kill all the Jews because he really wants to get to Mordecai. Haman is disposed of. The Jews are given a decree that they could defend themselves, which they do. And the Jewish people are saved because of Esther. You see, Esther's choice moved her from powerlessness to being influential. She was moved from powerless to being influential. There's 10 chapters in this book. I just want to encourage you, read over the book of of, of Esther. It's a great book. And if you want to, you can go to YouTube. You can go to the Bible Project. They have a great nine-minute Esther video on there. Maybe you want to look at that. Or Veggie Tales even has an Esther story. They kind of make it not quite as gnarly as it really is. But hey, you know, vegetables, it's all good. But check it out. It's an amazing story, one we can learn from. Because here, here's why I think we can learn from it. And this is the key for me that I want us to think about today. We all, we all have the opportunity to move from the setback of feeling powerless to the comeback of influencing the world around us, all of us. Everyone in this room, anyone living, listening to me online, we all have the power if we are willing to make some choices like Esther made. Our lives can make a difference. 
no matter how powerless you might have felt over the last year, no matter how powerless you might have felt in your life. Dallas Willard, one of my favorite authors, he said this, the ultimate freedom we have as individuals is the power to choose, to choose what we allow or require our minds to dwell upon and think about. How beautiful is that after a year of like, oh, I don't have any freedom, I don't have any of this. Oh, really? Dallas Willer would say the greatest freedom we have is the freedom and power to choose what we set our minds on. That's beautiful. I used to always tell high school kids when I was a youth pastor, man, feelings are real. They're just not always true. So my feeling of powerlessness, maybe you're feeling of powerlessness, man, it's real. That is a real and that's a deep feeling. It's just not true. And we see that in the book of Esther and we see that through this young girl that makes a very powerful decision. So I want us to look at three choices, three choices that we see that Esther made that I think we can consider. And maybe it'll help us move from the setback of powerlessness to a comeback of influence. Number one is this, choose to pursue wisdom. Choose to pursue wisdom. I have found that pursuing wisdom and making that a habit, not just in the big moments. And if you're just waiting for the big moment of choice to, to, to pursue wisdom, you're gonna, it's going to be a struggle. I'm talking every day, all the time, to become people that pursue wisdom. Make it a priority in your life. Proverbs 16, 16 says this, how much better to get wisdom than gold? To choose understanding rather than silver. So pursue and go after wisdom. I think there's basically two ways to do this. There's two different ways to pursue wisdom. You can pursue wisdom with others and you can pursue wisdom with God. And I just want to be honest with you. I, sometimes I can't tell the difference between the two. They're both highly important and needed, especially if you're feeling that powerlessness in your life. They're so important. Pursuing God's important. Pursuing his wisdom. In James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, If anyone lacks wisdom, right, let him ask of God, who gives generally to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Seek God. Seek wisdom from God. Man, I have found that in that time of powerlessness and that feeling of powerlessness, getting alone in prayer, seeking wisdom in prayer and in the Bible can be so helpful in aligning my heart and aligning my mind with God and not allowing that feeling of powerlessness to grab hold of me. It's empowered me to see things differently and to be able to have a clearer picture of really what's going on around me and to help me to make better choices. Again, the little choices that we make every day, that's gonna help me when the big one comes, right? When the big one comes. Esther asked all the Jews to fast for three days, asked all her friends that were in the harem with her to fast. She's going to do something crazy. She is seeking, kind of seeking God's help in that, I would say, when it comes to fasting and wanting wisdom before she moves forward. Now, I want you to pay attention to something here that I think is important. We're seeking wisdom from God, not the answer. <laughs> I'm sorry, you got to make the decision. And oftentimes the decision you make is going to be the answer you're going to experience. I have come to realize that, man, I could sit there and kind of, God, give me the answer, give me the answer, give me the answer. That's not what it's about. Give me wisdom so I can make a decision. Man, I'm a father of a 22 and 21-year-old. I'm hoping the older my kids get, the less they're going to come to me and go, Dad, what's the answer? Dad, what's the answer, right? That over time, hopefully they just grow in wisdom and they can make their decisions. Just uh, last year, my son bought his first car at 22 years of age. It was not the best experience to try to find a used car on Craigslist. And he would call me and go, man, dad, this guy said the car had 120,000 miles on it. I did a Kelly Blue Book check or whatever, the, the check on it. It says the last report was 230,000 miles. It was one little scam thing after another. And I'm going, yeah, I want to, he lives up in the Bay Area. I want to drive up there, son, I'll come help you. Let dad do the rescue. No way. As a matter of fact, I gave him a phone number to a guy that goes to Rancho here, a buddy of mine that buys used cars. My son contacted him, talked through stuff, learned how to research, and he ends up buying a car that's a great car for him. He had to have the wisdom. Some of us are seeking God to give me the answer. <laughs> this is not how it works. But he will give you wisdom. And in that wisdom, 
you can make better choices. With wisdom, we learn and we grow and we, we mature in our, in our choices and our decisions. That's what I think we should be seeking, not the answer. I hope that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. But it's not just God we should seek. We need to seek wisdom from others, people that we trust, people that we trust are wise, people we trust that they care for us. In Proverbs 15, 22 says, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. So man, the more we can seek wisdom from others, the better choices we might make and we might find our lives moving from that area of powerlessness to more of an area of influence. Man, I wanna tell you, over the last year, there was a few people in my life that I had to seek wisdom from in that time of feeling so deeply powerless and useless. There was a couple people I called every day to talk through my feelings that I knew were real, but they might not be totally true, but they were beginning to really affect me. And I don't think I could have made it through that feeling of powerlessness without some of these people in my life. So you need to seek that wisdom. Seek God and seek it from other people. There's another one that we see in Esther. Choose to consider others. <laughs> Choose to consider others. This is a huge factor, uh, a factor in my life and in yours. Choosing to seek and, and, and consider others, not just myself. Because when I start feeling powerless, I could start getting very myopic and self-centered. Have you ever felt that to be true? All of a sudden, I'm just sitting, especially last year when you're locked in and you're in your room and you're in your house, all of a sudden, it's just like, oh, man, I can just heap powerlessness on top of powerlessness on top of powerlessness, right? My mind when I'm by myself, I don't like my mind when I'm by myself. How about you? When I'm by myself and I just let it run, oh, man, so... Seeking others, realizing there's others around me, realizing that my choices and decisions, even the one to just remain wallowing in my powerlessness, is affecting people around me. I don't have to choose to influence people to realize I'm influencing people. You are all influencing people, and thinking about that can have a big impact and what goes on in your home, what goes on, you know, amongst your friends, at work, amongst your neighborhoods, we all have an influence. And I don't think that Esther would have made the decision she would have made if it wasn't for her considering all of the people. You know, she wouldn't have risked that, I don't think, if it wasn't for her saying like, okay, all my people are, in, are gonna be affected by this. That's why her thoughts are towards others, I believe is what gave her the courage to move forward. And to not wallow in her powerlessness, but to take a step and have a comeback of influence. Philippians 2, 3 says, in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not look only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. And it says your attitude should be the same as Christ. That's what God's example was through Christ considering us. So how much time do you really spend considering the interest of others? Do you consider the interest of your spouse, of your kids, of your parents? You consider the interest of your coworkers, your fellow students, those that are hurting, those that are suffering. Man, I've met so many people that have had radical changes. They have chosen radical changes in their life because they began to consider others. Adopt, I mean, I have some people that I know that have adopted, like it radically changed their life because all of a sudden their mind got on others. They've quit high power jobs and move into other things where they felt like they could make a better influence, right? I've seen people that their spending and what they spend money changed because they began to be captured by others and realizing that I have all these different realities that I can make a difference in. So seek wisdom, choose to seek wisdom, have that become a, choose to consider others, not just yourselves. And finally is number three, choose to do something, do anything. <laughs> choose to do something, do anything. I had a pastor that I was serving under that he said that many, many years ago, 20 years ago, and that thing is just stuck in my head. As I just sit there sometimes going, I should do something. It's like, I do something, do anything, do something, do anything. Don't just sit around and do nothing, right? Move, move. Don't wait to be motivated. Don't wait for a letter to come under your door from God. This is what I want you to do. Take a step 
and do something. My wife and I were talking about this when I was preparing this message. And she says, it's like powerlessness causes paralysis. How true is that, right? I mean, when paralysis sets in, it's hard. Oh, have you ever had a cast on and you take it off? I remember when I tore my Achilles tendon and then after the, I, they fixed it, after they took the cast off and they gave me the boot, the doctor said, okay, you're all fixed. You're all healed. You can walk on it now. Ha ha, yeah, right. I'm in a crutch going, oh, I don't want to walk on it. He goes, you can walk on it. You know, when I started walking on it, I was actually at our office with my crutch. I had the boot on and my, cr my crutch got caught on the wall and it fell out from underneath me. And I went, oh, I could walk, you know? Man, I was so stuck in my head that I can't move. It took a trip to move me forward. I literally threw my crutches in the office that day and never used them again. But it took movement. It took movement. You gotta move. Galatians 5.13 says, you, my brothers, were called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. Do something. Esther went for it, having no idea the outcome. What a crazy decision she made. What a crazy decision she made. Man, we are a diverse community of friends advancing the cause of Christ through mercy, justice, and love. That is our future. That is our vision moving into the future. What one of those three areas can you take a step in today to realize your life matters? You can make a difference. Choose something. Mercy, the needy, the powerless, the hungry, community mission of hope. Choose something. Give of your time. Give of your resources. Justice, the abused, the exploited, the marginalized. What can you do to seek wisdom, to consider others, and to do something? Because here's the bottom line. Or, or love, just within your own home. Here's the bottom line. You are not powerless. You are not powerless, especially as a follower of Jesus Christ. You are not powerless. Your life makes a difference. Do something that will influence the world around you because the feeling of powerless, it's real. It's just not true. Take a step. Don't let the feeling of powerless stop you from making a step to become someone that influences because God wants to use you. God wants to use us. Let's let them, okay? Let's let them as we move into 2021 and beyond and realize that today your life can make a difference. Father God, thank you for the story of Esther. Thank you for letting us be challenged by just this young lady that was in such a powerless position, but she made some choices. She listened to Mordecai. She sought you through fasting. She considered all her people and she did something. Help us as we leave from here to be this diverse community of friends that seek to advance your kingdom through justice, mercy, and love. What area might we start moving towards? Our lives do matter. We are not powerless. Give us the vision and give us the ability to move. For your glory and honor in Jesus' name.